Okay, it works, good, because I made this on Apple and it's on Microsoft, so like you never know how it's gonna go. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna quickly say that literally everything in my talk except for like my really personal experience has been said today to death. So that's actually a really awesome thing. It's an awesome problem to have that like you're the last talk and everyone's already covered it all, but I'm still gonna do my job. So um, hi, I'm Cherry. Um, it is my name. I get that question a lot. Um, you can also call me Ray, that's also my name. <laughs> I have two. Uh, I worked as an artist and photographer for over 12 years until disability meant that I had to change direction. Um, I'm an accessibility advocate for both the physical world and games and have been talking with games professionals about it for about four years now. I also stream gameplay and art on Twitch for a growing community. So I am a pretty nervous person. Um, and I thought about using this podium as a shield to give me plus 10 confidence, but podiums are really not made for people that are four foot high, so uh, feeling very exposed. <laughs> um, anyway. <laughs> I'm going to be sharing with you exactly why, as an industry and an indiv individual, you're so important to me and the huge difference you've made in my life. Um, I'm also going to be getting into a couple of specifics about how my particular crescendo of disabilities affect me. For example, you'll notice I'm reading my presentation to you today, which some say is a huge no for public speaking, um, but my cognitive disabilities mean that I have a hard time committing much to memory, um, and I only had like two to three weeks, so <laughs> um, here we go. Um, yes, this really is gonna be my deeply personal love letter. Uh, things are gonna get even more awkward than they are right now, so I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, my hope today is that either I'll inspire you with my tendency to overshare, or at the very least, I'm gonna make things so awkward that you can't help but think of people like me when you're striving to be inclusive. Many of uh, many people who love games like to brag about how they've been playing games since before they were born. Well, I am no different. Um, I really have loved games since before I have solid memories of childhood. I remember some of the first games I played. I remember the games I watched my dad and my cousin play while I unwrapped snacks for them like the dutiful little minion I was. Long before I was a super nerd about accessibility, I mean, I'm wearing a shirt, so. <laughs> games were a big help to my mental health and personal struggles. They got me through some big, scary things as a child and a teenager. And this is where my spark of adoration for the industry began. I love games so much that I even have a couple of very, a couple of, I'm gonna say slightly silly tattoos. Actually, they're pretty silly. Um, from the early 2000s, they feature relatively obscure characters from the sequels to Bubble Bobble and Time Splitters. <laughs> Even during times where I was so busy that I was working a rather unhealthy 60 hours a week, much of my identity has been rooted in games. Several of my friends are developers, and we spent most of our time socializing around games, um, like Rock Band and Left 4 Dead. Everything changed at 31. I'm sorry, I'm gonna get emotional. It's been a long day. It's not the first time I've been emotional today. <laughs> um, I had a very unexpected and sudden stroke due to an artery in my neck that tore. Um, it was spontaneous. It turned out I had this connective tissue disorder that makes me very fragile. At the time, I had no idea how much this would affect me. But this is where my love of games evolved into an obsession with how they could be more accessible. I was looking forward to R&R &R when I got out of the hospital. Um, while nursing the constant headache the artery tear had left me with, I remembered something. I'd wanted to play Dishonored. Um, I was so damn excited for this game, I'd, but I'd been too busy to play what with work. Um, but stealth, mystery, thieving, and roguing, how could I not be excited? It was just the pick-me-up I needed. I was wrong. I started up the game, and within five minutes of the tutorial, I was almost barfing in my lap. Um, I wish I would be in my normal hyperbolic self, but I'm not. The game gave me severe vertigo and nausea. I kept telling myself that it was the after effects of the artery tear, and I would get better, and be able to play this amazing game everyone was so excited about. I was wrong again. Every time I tried to play the game, the result was the same. It was as if I had towned 10 beers without even blinking. When I first tried to play Dishonored, I thought the problem was me. I casually mentioned to my developer friends, and they were equally surprised and baffled that my reaction was so physical. They sympathized, of course, but no one had any idea of how to fix it. But here's the thing. Many people get a little motion sickness from games, especially first-person games. 
but it's not as common to have a reaction so strong that someone just can't play the game at all, but we do exist. Dishonored isn't the only game I've simply been unable to play, but it was significant for me because it was the moment I discovered accessibility. It was the moment I realized it wasn't me, it was the games. Now, I'm not here to focus on the, on the games I can't play, but I do want to tell you sincerely from the bottom of my heart that video games have saved my life. I don't want to sugarcoat it and I don't want pity. Sorry. <laughs> but I do want, want to emphasize why my love of games runs so deep. The last five years have been quite the struggle from losing bodily and cognitive function to hospital stays, losing friends, communities, a lot of what made me me. After my stroke, my disabilities progressed very quickly. I went from being a mildly disabled person who could live a somewhat normal life to someone who is considered profoundly disabled in some ways. And I have several permanently implanted medical devices that actually do make me a cyborg, <laughs> which is kind of cool. Um, <laughs> more relevantly today, I can do, no longer do many of the things I love. Living with progressive disability can be really isolating. Now, what I'm about to say does kind of go against the grain of much of disability advocacy, but I want to be brutally honest. I simply can't do some of the things my disabled peers take for granted. Um, the fact that I'm autistic also plays into this. I'm different. I don't fit into society the way other people do, and it's both physically and mentally isolating. But games have saved me. By my love of games, I found the accessibility community. I became involved in advocacy work, and I found purpose. And of course, it's very personally motivated, but aside from my work with advocacy, I found I had community just talking about games. I started out by, believe it or not, live tweeting the games I was playing. This led to people encouraging me to stream on Twitch. It took a long time to get the courage to do so, and I'm sure I really don't need to go into the hundred reasons why, but what spurred me was meeting with the coalition and Microsoft's gaming for everyone last year. The team encouraged me to continue to be brave and to really show the world what inclusion is about. By involving me in their design process, I not only felt like I mattered and like they were taking accessibility to the next level, I felt empowered to be bolder with my presence in the community. Through streaming, I found even more community, people like me, but also people not like me at all. Just by being out there, I'm both showing how inclusion matters and finding a way to break down the ways people see disability. When we can play the same games as the rest of the community, they unite us despite how different we are. Games can be more than mere entertainment, they empower us. Inclusion at every level of the industry makes a difference. I'm up here today because I kind of want to ring the bell for inclusivity, and I do know I haven't been the first. I know it's been like every talk, but I think that's awesome. Just like I was encouraged to move forward with how I can make a difference, I want to encourage the industry to think of us as integral to the accessibility that is for us. So now my origin story is covered, let's get into the nitty gritty. Games have been my company, my community, my adventure, my therapy. They've challenged me in more ways than one. Games have even been pain management. I live with chronic pain, it's constant. Um, they are what pull me out of pain flares and trans transport me to another world. So when I say games save my life, I really mean it. Just like non-disabled players, games allow me to experience worlds, adventures, and abilities I'll likely never have in real life. Even though I, this is a common thread amongst people who love games, I'd say it's potentially more profound for disabled people. The sense of awe and excitement I get from riding a machine across beautiful lands in Horizon Zero Dawn, scaling buildings and, and mountains in Assassin's Creed, or surviving the weird and harsh winters of the long dark is an intense and emotional journey for me. I've lost a lot, there are even some things I never had. I'm no longer able to hike like I used to. I can't spend hours baking to de-stress or taking photos of everything that catches my obsessive eye. I sometimes can't stand to be in noisy and busy environments, surrounded by people, yet here are games that are giving that and more to me. I can't tell you how many hours I spent taking, oh, thank you. <laughs> I might need these. <laughs> I can't tell you how many hours I spent taking photos in Horizon Zero Dawn, Assassin's Creed Origins, or Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. Just three games from the last year that had robust and fairly accessible photo modes. All three of those games also made me cry on several occasions. This is a theme. <laughs> 
The games you all work so hard to make for us bring me so much. I have such deep connections to the games I love. I'll never be able to thank the industry as much as I'd like. The games I love make me feel wholer than I can in the society we have today. And believe me, I'll remember the ones that leveled the access for us and made access as effortless as it was for everyone else. I think I could definitely say this is true for other disabled gamers too. What I really want to get into in the second half of my talk is just a few of the things I'd personally love for you to keep in mind when working towards accessibility. Now this part shouldn't make me cry, hopefully. <laughs> First, what exactly is disability? Sitting up here in my wheelchair, I look disabled. It's kind of the go-to when someone mentions disability. I know, a wheelchair user. But my inability to walk very well is only one aspect of how disability affects me, and I haven't always used a wheelchair or been what we refer to as visibly disabled. I've always been autistic and had learning difficulties. I've always lived with chronic pain and fragile joints or other difficulties with physical activity. Much of disability is invisible and some may not even think of their impairments or need for access as disability. It's a huge spectrum and impossible for anyone to know every aspect. It can also affect anyone at any time. It doesn't matter what someone's background is, anyone can be disabled. So what does this mean for an individual? I consider myself multiply disabled, but also my disabilities fluctuate through any given day or week, and this makes me a somewhat complex case in terms of accessibility. My needs change frequently, even sometimes in the middle of playing a game. Multiply disabled simply means I live with more than one disability. This is surprisingly common, and amongst my disabled peers, most of them don't have any one single impairment. My personal list is too long to pass in one try, so I'll try and sum it up in regards to those that affect my ability to do things like play a game. First, cognitively, I'm autistic, I have ADHD and learning difficulties like dyslexia. As I mentioned, I've had sm multiple small strokes that affect memory and cognitive function. Motor function wise, I live with several progressive medical diagnoses that affect my coordination, muscle strength and nervous system function. One example is that as I use my muscles, they fatigue quickly and I go from being able to move easily to kind of being sluggish and surprisingly weak. You can imagine how this affects my ability to play a game throughout any given play session. Wow, so I mean, how on any earth does anyone account for all of these things in a single person, let alone across a diverse player base with hundreds or thousands of players with disabilities? Well, I believe accessibility is really not that much different than accounting for normal human variation. I would even argue that disability is normal human variation. Breaking disability down to account for it in development, the spectrum can seem vast and complex. Not only are there many different types of disabilities, they also interact. Working in accessibility advocacy, I know firsthand that the needs of the community can seem overwhelming. I empathize greatly with games developers and those behind the scenes who are working so hard to bring us the things we love. I'm sure if you're here today, you know having empathy for your audience informs good design. But I believe it goes two ways, and I want all of you to know and feel that we get it. I'm getting emotional again. <laughs> Many of us disabled gamers know the struggle of accessibility. We live and breathe it. We know how hard you're working. We see you and we appreciate you. So we've acknowledged that accessibility can seem like a monumental task, but I also want to gently say maybe it's not as complicated as it might seem. Options. Options go a long way to helping empower us to navigate our own impairments and in the myriad of ways they intersect. Accessibility isn't just good UI design or difficulty settings, but it also maybe doesn't need to fundamentally change the gaming experience for non-disabled players. All gamers love options. I haven't once seen a gamer complain about too many options. Okay, I'm sure someone has because some gamers enjoy a good whinge. <laughs> <laughs> Even Warframe that has so many options, it would take me an two, entire two GA conf talks to go through them. People rave about the range of options available to us. Most of my frustrations as a disabled gamer could have been solved had the options been given to me to change things in some way. Now, I don't have the time in my 30 minutes to talk in depth about everything accessibility, but believe me, if you give me a chance, I will present you with a very detailed personal wish list of options and enthusiastically and positively talk your ear off. So uh, insert self-promotion here. No, uh, really, get at me. <laughs> I am so happy to be in a room full of people on board with accessibility. I might be covering some things you already know, but let's see if we can't get into some specifics related to my personal experience. 
There's the physical interface, controllers, mouse, keyboard, and the like. There are so many solutions out there. Many of them are hacks, custom builds, or drip down to us from elite or hardcore competitive gaming. I personally use analog stick extenders, a one-handed controller instead of a keyboard, among other things including a very non-traditional desk setup in my living room. Talking of controllers, I just want to step back in time for a moment. I remember the N64 controller being so incredibly comfortable. It was the first time a controller felt like it was natural in my weird alien hands. It was also new and pioneering. It was so weird, in fact, that GoldenEye was developed in such a way to give players many options in how to use the controller. One of the first console games to do this that I know of. This was because not only was this stick thing new, players needed to be taught how to use it. It was actually a mystery to the developers in how any given player would even be able to use it. And thus, we had controller options. It was a long time before this spread across genres, and there's still a lot of games that leave this out, but it is something that can be invaluable to disabled gamers like me. I played countless hours of GoldenEye on my couch with friends, and also its successor, Perfect Dark. The layout that worked for me was pretty different to my friends, and they jokingly told me how weird I was, and how they had no idea how I was so good with the way I played. Button remaps are a big deal for both physically and cognitive disabled gamers like me, even when disabilities are relatively mild. Many PC games have key binding options, but it's often left out of console games. Now, sure, we have um, remaps on PS4 and Xbox One uh, at the system level now, and I'm really happy for this step in the right direction, but it has some problems, and it was only intended as a Band-Aid. Button remaps are important for using third-party assistive tech, but my personal and simple example is that sometimes I need to swap the, controller, uh, the shoulder buttons due to the muscle weakness and chronic pain I've mentioned. Um, the top buttons are easier to pull and have less travel distance, but the general standard is the lower two are for primary actions. So when I'm forced to change this in the OS, it likely breaks the UI, and many games inevitably giving, keep giving me incorrect button prompts. This then leads me to hit a wall with the dyslexia and executive function. You see, sometimes I have to choose a lack of control and physical pain over constantly pressing the wrong buttons, leading to confusion and frustration, or vice versa, depending on the day. This isn't to even mention my struggles with remembering the button remaps and having to change it constantly when switching from game to game. What may seem like a solution is either flawed or causes more problems where disabilities intersect. So please allow me to change controls for gameplay alone by including the functionality in the game itself. This is where involving the community can highlight the issues we face that might be being overlooked. Now, Jason Cannon gave a great talk today on how household games achieved accessibility in way of the passive fist. And I really want to emphasize that they mostly su succeeded. It's the first brawler I've been able to play in years, like actual years. And was I good at it? No, not even like a little bit. Um, but I had so much fun dying 26 times in the first three hours. Or I was counting on, I was streaming it too. <laughs> I died 40 times on the second boss. It has relatively simple controls by today's standards, but I still struggled. Button mapping allowed me to customize the game for me and my weird thumbs. It doesn't matter how simple a game's controls are, I promise it can benefit from button, button mapping options. As an aside, the visual options in Passive Fist, such as background contrast and HUD enlargement, while intended for visual impairment, were also very helpful for me. Now this leads me quite nicely into my next point. It feels important to note at the end of an amazing day on accessibility that for one, uh, accessibility for one group can lead to accessibility for others. You've heard from a panel of deaf players how important good subtitles are. And I hope it's pretty obvious that deaf players need subtitles by this point. But did you know that autistic people like me can also benefit from subtitles? I process information in every form differently to most. I especially struggle when speech is coupled with animated lips that move imperfectly with the words. It's kind of difficult to describe to non-autistic people how it feels, since I hear fairly normally. But the short of it is that subtitles help me enormously. I need subtitles. I miss a lot without them. In real life, I tend to read lips to help me process, or I can just ask someone to repeat themselves. Or, you know, hilariously nod along and laugh at inappropriate moments when I <laughs> awkwardly pretend I know what the hell is going on. <laughs> Yet when subtitles aren't clear enough, whether that's due to font choice, text size, or contrast issues, my imperfect sight, dyslexia, and ADHD all collide, and I'm likely to get even less information than if there were no subtitles at all. Similarly, as you've heard from blind gamers and those advocating for blind accessibility, sound is incredibly important. 
This is true for other disabilities too. Again, due to being autistic, um, I live with something called sensory processing disorder where I process sensory information differently. This also isn't exactly quick or easy to explain, but the short of it is too much of anything or everything and I can get extremely overwhelmed. At best, I can't process information or control the game effectively. And at worst, it can lead to a response that looks to those on the outside like an extreme emotional and physical overreaction that we call meltdowns. What helps me is good audio design, but also audio sliders. The ability for me to independently control audio channels in a game goes a long way to avoiding sensory overload and helps me play better. Here's a quick example. I found the audio design in Horizon Zero Dawn a little imbalanced at times. It seemed geared to impart stress and make the machines, giant, extremely aggressive robots, feel more real and threatening. They also had battle music that got super loud. Obviously, this is a common technique used to emphasize combat, and it's great, really great, that there are studios making such intense and frankly difficult games that match the depth of their storytelling and world building. I don't want this to change for anyone. I am so deeply in love with this part of the industry that I want it to stick around and grow. Yet, when I first started playing Horizon, I was having meltdowns and finding the combat almost impossible. I had to remove myself from the game and examine why. Perhaps it's interesting to note that I don't always know at first what I'm finding inaccessible about a game. I assumed my main issue was my hands, but it wasn't that, or wasn't just that, I should say because <laughs> it was partly that. Um, my needs aren't always immediately obvious to me, even the player. The barriers I faced added to the already steep difficulty curve that was likely intentional and integral to the game design. But being able to adjust the audio slider so that it felt more balanced for me and my impairments led to better access. Without this and other options, I would have had to stop playing the game, which would have been a tremendous shame, because by the end it had become my favorite game of all time, and I felt a deeply personal connection to it. In contrast, Persona 5, which I did also adore, had a truly fantastic soundtrack and sound effects, but no audio options at all, not even a master volume slider. This made it really difficult for me to play at times, and the only option I had was to just stop playing. So what about this problem I had with Dishonored? My stroke was in 2013, and a few months ago I thought I'd give Dishonored 2 a try. I was really hoping that the design had improved, because I was so excited by the news of the expansion uh, with the female protagonist last year. I downloaded the demo, and sure enough, within about 10 minutes, I felt like I was spinning and I was going to bath. Nothing had changed. I still have a lot of difficulty, especially with slower first-person games and the so-called walking sim genre. Kona was a little indie game set in the Canadian North that came out last year. It was a really great and surprisingly weird and inclusive story that I encourage people to play. This eerie little game had a head bob toggle and camera sensitivity sliders. Headbob makes, makes a first-person game feel more immersive and realistic, and I can totally get behind that. But being able to turn it off is the difference between whether I can play or not. As for camera sensitivity, you wouldn't think a console version of what is essentially a walking sim would need a sensitivity option, yet for people like me, it can be essential. Other options that can help solve this problem are angle of view options and non-lurchy camera movements. Similarly, Camera shake triggers migraines and muscle fatigue in my eyes that get so severe that I can't read anymore. It's an effect that I personally feel should be something more akin to a seasoning rather than a source you douse a game in. But this is subjective and often down to the vision of any team behind a game, which I love about games. But what if it causes your audience physical pain? Monster Hunter World is a game you may have heard of. I mean, maybe. It hasn't really been a big deal or anything. <laughs> Now, this game has some accessibility issues. Could they do better? Yes, most games could. But you know something they did right for me? There's a screen shake toggle. I mean, honestly, it's the first time I've seen this option in a very, very long time. And it's meant I could play better and longer. I have tons of fun destroying beautiful and probably endangered beasts. <laughs> I'm feeling a little bit guilty about the entire thing. A screen shake toggle could ben be beneficial to nearly every action game I play. My last example today relates to executive function and memory. Open world games exploded onto the scene and now they dominate in a big way and across genres. They can be overwhelming to the most organized of people, but for those of us that have disabilities related to executive function or memory, we sometimes find them difficult to play at all. They can be overwhelming, stressful, and tiring. If the world opens up too quickly, I'm landed with too many quests, or the map is too cluttered, it's almost like I have no room to think. With few options to change things, I have little choice in managing it myself. 
Batman Arkham Asylum was a good, option, a good example. I quit after the first hour and I never went back. On the other hand are games that go for a less structured approach. This can be done well, but it can be a miss for exec executive function. I was frustrated and overwhelmed for much of Breath of the Wild due to almost no map icons in an enormous world with vague direction and a lot of repetition. I persevered and I did manage to finish the main story, but it really wasn't a great experience for me, unlike, I think, the rest of the planet. <laughs> Um, options are where it's at. Near Automata is a wonderful example. In my mind, they perfected the, min the minimal design. A large world to explore with a subtle yet clear structure that eventually gets everyone to where they're going. I played that game to death. I got every single ending. I cried at least three times and I thoroughly enjoyed every damn second. And I have so many more accessibility things I would love to talk about, so please do get at me. It might seem overwhelming, it might seem an overwhelming task, uh, sorry, a monumental task, but you're not alone. Disabled gamers like me want to help you. We are experts, include us. As Ian mentioned earlier, and I think someone else did too, I forget who, uh, but Able Gamers Charity created their long anticipated player panel for connecting disabled gamers with studios of all sizes to help play test their games. When they first planned the project, they anticipated maybe 50 people would be interested. They had over 300 sign up in just like two weeks. I'm here to not only awkwardly tell you how much I adore you, how much I appreciate you, how much you have saved my life, but also to ask you to include me and those like me. So this isn't the end. It does sound like it's the end, but I have a little bit more to say after this, but it is dangerous to go alone. Take us. <laughs> Here's my self-promotion for real this time. In my experience, the best results of implementing accessibility are when disabled people are included in the process. If you don't know where to begin, start to begin reaching out to disabled players. Start with those of us who are here today, obviously me, Sightless Combat, um, Michael Anthony, Kelsey Fireheart, or my friend Chris, Deaf Gamers TV. There are more of us in the audience too. I, I know you're out there. I can't see with the lights in my eyes though. <laughs> there are more of us in the audience who I'm sure would love to speak to you afterwards. Come find me after we're done today. I'll be hanging out for a bit. I'll be around GDC. I'm on a panel on Wednesday with Tara, Ian, and Jason, and also David, who I think is that way. There we go. <laughs> um, I'll be at Microsoft Game and a Disability Reception tomorrow, or you can find me on Twitter, Twitch, or email. Check out Able Gamers Charity, too. You're not in this alone. We, we are here. <laughs> now, if I were to generalize, I'd tell you that disabled people are great overachievers. Even if something is prohibitive or extremely difficult, we strive for a way. Aside from my impairments, much of society still isn't accessible. Progress has been made, but there's a surprising way to go. Life as a, as a disabled person isn't easy, but while we work to improve it, I have to adapt and find ways to live the life I want, regardless of the barriers I face. This goes for games as well. We face barriers in games all the time, but we are some of the most creative solutionists. Again, we often find a way. Games are meant to be challenging. The challenge is half the fun and all the sense of accomplishment I get from playing them. Now, one of the hottest things today is ultra hard games. We're seeing more and more of these from platformers to action RPGs, which is great. I revel in the challenge of playing games, but it, it's nothing new to me. Most games I've played have been hard mode for me in some way because I've been working around barriers. Sometimes one of the mistakes people make when I talk about accessibility in games is that disabled gamers are just looking for easy mode. But while difficulty options are important, what I really want isn't games that are easy. I want the challenge. I want to have fun. I want to love the game, the same games as my non-disabled peers do as much as they do. I want to feel like I matter to the industry I adore so much. For me, accessibility is about quality of life. A lack of accessibility doesn't always equal zero access at all. It can e more often than not mean playing as painful, exhausting, extra frustrating, or just not very fun. Sometimes it's a reminder of how different I am to the majority of the world. Now, gamers like to make jokes about things that break their immersion, glitches, bugs, clunky UI. But as a disabled gamer, my immersion can be broken by heightening my sense of being disabled, of being different. Again, games unite people. They provide a wonderful sense of community. Thousands or sometimes even millions of people getting excited about a game is an incredible thing to behold. The hype is real. It's really real and it's an absolute thrill. Sadly, when a game isn't accessible, what unites thousands or millions of people isolates me and others like me. 
It's a little bit heartbreaking, just a little, to feel like you're on the fringe or the outside of that shared cultural excitement. It's also frustrating where gains are held up as pillars of accomplishment for the industry, but they weren't inclusive of disabled people. Immersion broken, and we're right back to feeling isolated and like that thing for everyone else just that everyone else adores just isn't for us. But when games get it right, when they level the access, when we're included, whether directly or indirectly, it is magnificent. Suddenly we're enveloped into the fold. We can talk with our non-disabled peers about how fun, challenging, exciting, or downright beautiful a game is. We can play alongside them. We can laugh at our failures, and we can cheer at our hard-earned wins. We're no longer the disabled gamer. We're just a gamer like everyone else. Games that provide us the options we need not only give us great adventure, profound experience, and fun, they include us in a community that otherwise we aren't a part of. It is a brilliant thing. I deeply adore this industry and everything it does for me. I'll be loyal to the grave to accessible games and inclusive studios. I'll promote them to death and defend their honor everywhere I set wheel. <laughs> for real though, sorry, I'm getting snotty now. <laughs> for real though, I want games the, to be the best they can be. I don't want them to fundamentally change. I want them to keep growing and moving forward. I want games to be for everyone regardless of gender, race, identity, or whether they're disabled. I believe that accessibility is key for the future of the games, that it benefits everyone, not just disabled people. And if you're here today, I'm sure you believe that too. So much has been accomplished in the past couple years, and I'm so proud of you as an industry. The foundations we have are solid, so let's keep building until we have a thriving and inclusive, fully realized ecosystem. This quote I have up behind me seems so apt for this point in time that I just can't help but leave you with that. Work as if you live in the early days of a better world. So thank you for having me up here, for listening to my emotional story and for letting me be so vulnerable. Um, I hope I and my fellow gamers have added a little fuel to keep your fire bright. At the very least, I hope I reassured you that no matter what, I love you. <laughs> we love you too. <laughs>